Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to State Management in GraphQL using React Hooks and Apollo. Our guest speaker today is Shruti Kapoor of PayPal. My name is Jennifer Ponder. I am located in Atlanta, Georgia. I am the Senior Front End Leadership Fellow for the Front End Track Community. And today's guest, Shruti Kapoor, she's located in San Jose, California. She is a senior software engineer at PayPal. She is passionate about building web applications in React, Node.js, and with the GraphQL stack. She loves dev jokes and tweets, and frequently uh, she's on Twitter, and you can reach her at Shruti Kapoor 08. Now we want to go into our Women Who Code mission, which speaks to inspiring women to excel in technology careers. Our vision speaks to a world where women are representative as technical executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. And please take a look at our code of conduct. If what we want to do is foster an inclusive and collaborative environment. If this is something that you're not currently seeing, please let us know. Send us an email to frontend at womenwhocode.com. And also you can reach us at womenwhocode.com as well. And you can take a look at our full code of conduct there. Also, we would like to get into our Women Who Code front end track information. Uh, uh, most of our members do know they can register for events or become a member at womenwhocode.com front end, especially if this is your first time. This is great information for you to see here. Uh, if you would like to email us, if you want to do a tech talk for the front end track community, definitely email us, reach out to us, or share our email address with others who'd like to do a tech talk with us. And if there's something you'd like to see coming to the track, definitely let us know at that email, front end at womenwhocode.com. Com. Also, our social media, you can reach us on Twitter, www.codefrontend, and also on Instagram at www.codefrontend1. And we do have Slack available. Just take a look at our Twitter page. We do have our Slack link pinned to the top of our Twitter. And also on Instagram, we do have the, the Slack link in our bio. So you can find us there. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker, Shruti Kapoor. Thank you so much. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes, I see it. Cool. So hi, everybody. I'm Shruti Kapoor. And today I'm going to be talking about GraphQL and state management, especially with using React hooks. So a brief introduction about me. I'm a senior software engineer at PayPal. Um, and at PayPal, I work with three technologies, mostly GraphQL, React, and JavaScript, and I love building and challenging engineering problems. For today, I'm going to be talking about how we can use state management using React hooks in a GraphQL application. So for the presentation today, my goal is to help you think in terms of data and how data flows in a React application. So if you're connected with a GraphQL API or even with a REST API, when data comes in from the server, how can you use that data on your React application to use hooks to manage that data? So I want to give you enough information so that by the end of this talk, you can go and start experimenting with hooks yourself. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm going to briefly talk about the different types of state and how hooks can play into each of those types. I'll give a brief introduction for hooks for those of you who are not familiar with it. I'll talk about how React hooks works with GraphQL and give a demo. And then I'll talk about Apollo, which is one of the libraries that is used for GraphQL and some of the hooks that they have recently launched, which makes GraphQL application much simpler. So let's dive in into what is state. As most of you might be familiar, there's two types of state. State simply is the data that is stored in your front-end application. So if you have a form and you're editing some data on the form or you're sending some data over, that is state. So there's two types of state. There's global state and local state. Local state is a state that sits in a local component. So for example, if you have a form, the data that you need in the form sits within the form. So that is the local state of the form, of that component. 
Whereas global state is a state that exists globally throughout your application. Let's look into it into a little bit more detail. So global state is a state that exists throughout your application. A common example is when you log in, you have a user that you want to share across your data, across your components. So that is the data that you're sharing across all of your components. Another example is your router data. So all of your pages need to know what page it is connected to using the router. Let's look into another example. So this is the dashboard that you will see when you log into PayPal. On the dashboard, there is a logout button and login button. So once you log in, we can see what user you are, what is your profile name, what is the list of your authorizations that we've provided you. So that is a global state that we need to carry on in the entire application. Each of the component needs to know which user we are talking to so that they can fetch maybe like a list of users or maybe a list of transactions for that particular user. Now let's look at local state. So local state, as the name suggests, is logic that exists within the local component itself. I talked about forms as an example. Let's look at an example in detail. So let's say this is the form on our, on our website. When a user enters their name, we want to maybe show their uh, a validation that the name is correct, or if they're entering an email, we have a validation for regex to make sure that the email is in the right format. So that kind of data just needs to know, just needs to be within the form itself. Another component, like the authorization component, doesn't need to know that. So that will be a local state, the state that is local to that component itself. Now, currently, there are multiple ways of managing state. Let's look at some examples. So there is a React component state, such as use state or set state, the context API, the Redux, MobX, MobX state tree, React hooks, which are the newest edition, and Apollo client, which is used to manage state in a GraphQL application. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on React hooks. So how many of you are familiar with hooks? Uh, you can type in the chat and just say hooks. And I'm gonna watch out on this side, Shruti, as well. Okay, we have one Mieler Kiev and Madeline Hodges. Okay. And Tanya. So it looks like, and Renee and Vatna. So we look like we have about five or six people. Cool, awesome, thank you. All right, now how many of you are familiar with GraphQL? Now type GraphQL. One person. Yep, looks like we have about uh, just one. Okay, no problem. So if you're not familiar with GraphQL, don't worry. I'll give introductions. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to GraphQL while we go through the demo. So what, let's talk about what are React hooks. So according to Dan Abramov, he says that hooks are a more direct explanation of React. I think hooks are cool because they are basically just functions that let you use state within a lifecycle, within the uh, React lifecycle itself. So traditionally, we've been thinking of React uh, state as in use component and mount, component will unmount. So we think of like how components will mount and then start using state or start using like our, um, our data or start sending our data in that way. So we have to first think of which lifecycle method I need to use and then think of what data I need to access. But with React hooks, you don't need to worry about lifecycle methods anymore. You can just start using hooks without having to worry about at what point React is rendering it. So instead of thinking about how React is doing its job, you just have to worry about how your data is going to move through the components. So why do we need hooks um, when we have so many other libraries? Well, the truth is that state management is currently a hard problem. We get data from the API, but to manage it on the client, there are so many different options. And if we have just a simple form, it becomes really over-engineered solution to use Redux, which comes with a lot of boilerplate. Or if you're using GraphQL, then you don't know which library to use. Um, so when I first started with uh, React and front-end development, I was working with React, I was working with Redux. There was also MobX, 
and there was also the uh, the component state that comes with react there was also context api and i had no idea what state management to use so in the first few weeks i kind of felt like this so that's why I think React hooks are really cool because they simplify all of that problem. And now you can use state within your React component without having to have any other third party library like Redux or Polo Client or Mobix. So these libraries are very successful and they are very popular today. So we have to look at what are some cool things that these are providing. Let's first look at Redux. So Redux is really good because we have this connect function at the top that actually magically links everything together. And when you put data in one store, from one component into the store, magically you have that data in another component. And that is happening because of the connect function. So that's a really powerful thing of Redux. One another cool thing that Redux provides is that because you're putting everything in the store, you have access to it from every component. So you don't need to like manually pass your props down to every channel component. So that's a really good power, power of Redux. The problem with Redux is that even if you have form state, you have to still put it in the store because that is how components share the data. So all of your state becomes a basically go global state. And then Redux also comes with huge boilerplate. So if I just want to use a form and I just want to send data from my form to another component that's on the same page, I need to start writing all the actions, the reducers. So it comes with a lot of code that I need to write for maybe just like one validation function. Now let's look at context provider. So this is the context API that comes uh, directly from React. It's really cool because just like Redux, you can lift the state up from the component and provide it at a top level component. And because you're lifting the state up, you don't need to provide your state or your props down to every single child component. So it's really cool in that sense. But the problem is that because you're putting one component responsible for context, whenever any of the child component updates or whenever any of the state of the child component updates, the entire component tree updates. So if your context from a different component is updating in the parent, another component that is not even related to it also updates. So the entire tree updates. Now let's look at hooks. So the two main problem that we have seen with state management is prop drilling, which is passing down props. And hook solves that because it's also lifting state up, just like how context API is doing. Another big problem is the boilerplate. And with hooks, actually, there comes no boilerplate. You can start using hooks with just one line, use state, use context, and so on, without having to have any sort of actions, reducers, and things like that. And the problem of context reload, which comes from context API, can be solved by keeping your context um, close to the component that need it. So if two components need the same context, you can keep it within that context. And I'll show you an example of how that works. So the four different hooks that I'm going to be talking about today is use effect, use reducer, use context, and use state. We looked at local state and global state before. So use state is a state that helps in managing local state. So this is the state that, this is the hook that replaces this dot state in class for components. And it, is, it can be used to share data between the form or the same component itself. Let's look at an example. So use state can be, it's a, as I said, hooks are functions, right? So use state can be used by just passing in a variable to it. And what it gives you back is a state variable, which in this case is count, and a setter, which is set count. So to update the state variable, you will be calling the set count function. You can initialize it with a constant like zero. So in this case, your count would be zero. And you can update count by calling set count one, two, and so on. Here's an example. So we've used count in you click count times. And then to update it, we're just passing in the variable count plus one. So super easy. Now here's another example. Like if you're building a to-do list, you might have a object which has a list of text, um, uh, uh, items that are done or not done. So you can pass objects as well to use state. So you will have a state variable like things he says, and then to update, you can use a setter function that comes out of use state as well. And then one cool thing is that if you want to manage how 
uh, how if you want to make your own hook, you can use multiple hooks together. So here we are using a use count hook, and then we're also using a use state hook together. So you can you can actually make a custom hook by using multiple hooks. The only constraint there is that you need to return a state variable, which here is things he says, and a setter function, which is count. So now let's look at use effect. So use effect can be used to update DOM and it accepts a function with effectful code. So by effectful code, I mean any function that does side effects. So for example, calling an API or updating the DOM or maybe having subscriber. So it is similar to component did mount in a classful component. Here's an example. Let's say you want to update the title. You can have you click count times and this can be the count can come from use state function. So here we are modifying the DOM. We're doing an effectful code and hence we have document.title. Here's another example of how you can use subscriber. So initially, so if you have a subscriber function, you can have handle status change, which will be a subscriber function. And then you can call the subscriber by calling, by passing it back into your subscribe to friend status. One cool thing about use effect is that not only does it, uh, you can, can it be used to do effectful code, but it can also be used to do cleanup after, let's say a subscription is done. So not only can you subscribe to friend status, but you can also unsubscribe from friend status when effect has, has finished running. So the way this works is that React will look at, React will first render the DOM tree and then look at whether I have any use effects. So when it finds a use effect, it'll do the, it'll do the function, the effectful function. And then afterwards, if there is a return provided with the use effect, it'll think, oh, okay, this is used for cleanup. So then it will go back and run the return function to clean up after your use effect. So the two hooks that we looked at were use effect and use state. Now let's look at two other hooks. Uh, if you're familiar with context API or Redux, these would look very familiar to you. And use context and use reducer can be used to manage global state across your application. So here's an example of context API. Let's see we have, if you're familiar with context API, remember that there was a provider where you provide some value and then there was the consumer function at the end, which actually consumes the value that you provided in the provider. So use context hooks work similarly. You'll have a use context um, function where you will use the value that was provided by the provider, which is my context here. So one thing to watch out is that use context can only be used to read a context, but you'll still have to use the context provider dot provider API to provide the value at the top level. And then if you're familiar with Redux, this might look very familiar to you. So there is a state and dispatch that comes for, from use reducer and the functions that you pass in is your reducer function itself, initial arguments. Now let's look uh, at an example. So I'm going to put the slide up for a minute so you can copy this code if you want to. Um, let me also paste this in the chat. If you want to follow along, feel free to copy this. And I'll pause here for a minute. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we could still see it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so if most of you have opened, this is the application that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so this is an application that has a form component with a text description, and then it has a button that actually adds this form or this data that we added into the API. And then we have sort of like a get feature here that fetches the data from the API. So if you want to try it out, feel free to add a song so I can reload the page and see what you've added.
And this can just be a song from anywhere, Shirley? Anywhere, any language. And to test it out, I'm also going to add my new song, which I'm just composing on the fly. So as you can see, I added a song and it gets added into this um, list of songs that I fetch from the API. This application is using React hooks in the background. And to show you how that works, let me walk you through the code of the application. Is the code legible enough? Are you showing your code editor, Trudy? I am. Okay, I can't see that. Uh, let me see. Let me try sharing again. Okay, are you able okay. to see it now? Yep, we can see it now. Cool. Okay, so um, to start with this uh, with this application, I will walk you through the I I'll walk you through how this application is set up. So this application, as I said, uses React hooks, but for the API, it uses GraphQL. And don't worry about how that works. I'll, I'll tell you how that works. So for using graph, uh, for using hooks, um, we have to first think about which component will be my parent component. So which that is the component where I'm going to set up my context. So for the purpose of this application, I've decided that my app.js component would be the component that I'm going to set up my context provider in. Now this is the component where I will use the use context hook to set up an initial state. And I'm also going to be using use reducer hook to update my application. So when I write a song and I publish it, when I click add song, I will be using use reducer to update my global state, which would be the context. So again, I'm putting my global state in context and then using use reducer hook to update that global state. Now, once I've set up my context and use reducer, all I need to do is use the provider API to pass that value in for the context and the dispatch. So I've set up my use context and use reducer in this app.js. Now let's go into my first component, which is the home component. So home component is the component that renders both this form and this get API and this get uh, list of songs plus this uh, uh, button. So let's look into how this works. So this is, this, is my, um, this is my home component. It has an add song form, which is this one. We'll get into it in a bit. And then I'm getting this list of state. This state is actually coming from use context. So remember I said that use context is global. It's used to manage global state. I set the state in app.js and now I can just use that state by calling my use context function, the React hooks. So once I have access to state, I'm just going to loop through this by a simple div function. Now, let's say that I'm adding something and I want to update that. How does that work? So before we get into that, let's also look at how this data actually renders on the page. And this is where GraphQL comes in. So remember I said that I'm using a GraphQL API. It's super simple. So with GraphQL API, it's just, some, it's just, just like another API. But the only difference is that because on this page, I need the name of the song, I need the artist, and I need the lyrics. So that's three fields. And that's exactly all the fields that I'm going to ask for. And what's cool about GraphQL is that because I asked for three fields, it'll only give me three fields. So I don't get a ton of data back and then I don't need to filter through my data on the client side. So this way I can prevent a lot of state management that I would have to do with other APIs. So this is why I really like GraphQL. So now what I do on the page is that the first thing that it does is it fires a query. Query is kind of like a get request to the server. So it says, my client needs three fields, artist, name, and lyrics. So give me that data back. Once that data comes back from the GraphQL API as a query, it is then used by this use effect hook. So what React does is it paints the storm, it fires up the query, 
And then once it's done painting the DOM, it says, okay, do I have any effect hooks? And it does, it finds one. So then it updates using the dispatch action, which is actually coming from the use reducer. So this is how we're updating our global state. I'm going to fire an action called add content and the payload is the songs, which I got from my GraphQL API. So in short, page renders, DOM does, uh, uh, React uh, finishes up rendering up the DOM. Um, query is fired in the background. And then use effect, uh, React looks for any use effect hook, says, oh, I have a hook. Let's update. Let's do what the hook is telling me to do, which is dispatch. And that updates the global state. And that's how you see the list of songs. Now that is getting the, the getting the data, but also we want to modify the data because we have this function, this form here that sends data to the API. So that is the add song component here. Let's look into it in brief. So what add song component does is it does something called a mutation, which is another GraphQL way of updating data. So just like how we would update data using post or put or delete or patch in REST API, in GraphQL, we would do a mutation. Let's see how it works. So for GraphQL, it'll say, I need to update. So let's see what are the fields that my client needs. It has a name, it has an artist, and it has lyrics. So I have got three fields. I need to send these three fields to the API. So GraphQL is going to say, I need to send these three fields, and let's fire a mutation for that. So that's what mutation is doing right here. Now, once the mutation is done firing, once I send the mutation over, I'm also going to update my state. So I'm adding that content into the songs. This is the dispatch I'm sending. And now I have this form here, right? But when I send the data, I also want to clear out this form because I don't want stale data on this. For that, remember we said use state is used to update local state. So here I'm using a use state, which I initialize with name state variable use state, artist, and lyrics. So I'm going to use those three functions here to clear out my form once I'm done firing a mutation, once I'm done updating my API. So I'm using use state in this component to update local state of the form itself. I'm using the use context to get data from, to get the dispatch function that I can use as a use reducer to update my state once I'm done sending a mutation. And then I'm using the mutation from GraphQL to actually update the API. Mutation is similar to a post or a patch from REST API. And now let's look at the component. So the component is pretty simple. I've got an input field for name, artist, and lyrics. And I have a simple button. So my button actually fires the mutation. So in short, we use use state to update the local state. We use use context to keep a track of global state in the application. We use use reducer to update that state whenever we had to the global state. And then we use use effect to call our GraphQL API. So that's how you can use React hooks. Let me describe that to you in a recipe form now. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Cool. So we initialized our state using initial state. And then we set up our use reducer in our app.js function. First thing we did was figure out where we're which co component is going to be our parent component. And that is where we use the use context hook and use reducer hook to set up our context. Then we hooked up our GraphQL API and you can use REST API here using use effect. Then we use the use context and use reducer in any component that needs to update the state or receive that global state. And then whenever we need to use use state, whenever we need to use local state for forms or any other components, we use to use state. So that's how hooks can work with, uh, with a, a React application. Now, if you're interested in GraphQL, Apollo Client, which is a very popular library for GraphQL, has released a few hooks that I will briefly talk about. So I use query and use mutation are the two hooks that they have released. They're also React hooks. Let's look at how they work. If you remember from the code example, I had mutation as a render component at the top, and then you are passing in whatever function you need to update. With the help of use mutation, actually, you can just use it in form of like a function. So instead of having a render pop, you can replace it with use mutation. Makes the code much cleaner. 
And then same with graph with uh, use query. So before, if you had, if you remember, I had this code where I was calling graph to a function at the end. So with use query, we can replace that with just a function component. So that's all I have for you today, but I do want to leave with one dev joke. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send it to me on Twitter. Or if you want the slides, let me know, I'll send out on Twitter. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Shruti, for the presentation. And now we wanna open the floor up to any questions. So if you all have any questions for Shruti, you can just put, put them into our chat or our QA box here. Um, and before we close out the webinar for today, we have some closing uh, updates. And I do want to just hop in for just a second while we uh, let everyone get the questions together, Shruti, and just ask you, um, it seems like now we're noticing GraphQL, which it's been around for quite some time, but it's picking up more and more steam as well as Apollo. Where do you see uh, the use of GraphQL and Apollo going as far as state management, you know, with different companies, whether they're small or larger corporations getting involved with uh, involving that into their stack? How do you see that changing uh, and growing? Yeah, so um, Apollo has made a lot of updates to the way that they are using state and managing state. Initially, they had Apollo link state, which is another NPM module you could use. But now Apollo is bringing in state as a first citizen itself into their clients. So a lot of companies are now following the track of Apollo client and actually starting to use Apollo client to manage their state uh, in their client side application. So a lot of companies are inclined in using what comes out of uh, Apollo client directly in, when they are using GraphQL. Um, one of the cool things that Apollo Client does is cache, um, so you can store your data within cache itself, which is really useful for like mobile applications. That's awesome. That's awesome. And also, too, um, I know you um, shared your Twitter with everyone. Is there any a top of mind great resources you can give to folks who want to just continue their learning with GraphQL and React hooks? Uh, in Apollo, um, or either if you're getting started out and you're still just trying to get your feet wet, any uh, top one, two, or three uh, resources you'd like to share with everybody really quick? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was starting out, I found a course by Steven Greider on Udemy. Let me actually put that down in the chat. Uh, okay. Steven Greider from Udemy. The course is called um, React with GraphQL, I believe, something like that. Um, and I found that really helpful because I came from a React background and it actually takes you into using GraphQL. Um, and what I like about that is that it's not just, uh, um, it's basically platform agnostic. They're not just using Apollo, but they also talk about how to use GraphQL with Express. And I thought that was really cool for me. Um, so Udemy has a really good resource. If you're into books, Eve Porcello has a really good book on learning GraphQL, which is, um, very simple and easy to understand. I really found it helpful. Um, the official documentation by Prisma and uh, Apollo on their documentation website is very helpful as well. So I believe it's apollo.org and prisma.org. Um, Prisma actually has kind of like a quiz-based approach of teaching GraphQL, which was really helpful in getting the concepts in. So I would highly recommend those resources. Those are awesome, awesome, yeah. Um, we did see someone that had a raised hand. If you have any questions, just wanna make sure we get to everybody because I know sometimes our webinar events, they go uh, a little fast and you have to get back from your lunch break. Uh, but definitely, uh, if you wanna send those questions to front end at Women Who Code and I can get them over to Shruti. Um, but definitely great information, Shruti. I know a lot of us, I'm, I'm really uh, enthused by React. I specialize in React as well. So all of this, you know, that's coming out lately with GraphQL and the state management React hooks, I'm definitely excited about it. So definitely loved all the information you shared here. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to go ahead and share our closing updates again. If you all have any uh, further information, um, that you'd like to share any questions, definitely let us know. And I'm just going to share our closing updates here, what we have for our front end 
this Friday Slack study group that is every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you have a time to come in, drop in, definitely do so. Uh, of course, March, you know, is React Month here on Women Who Code Front End. So look out for new tech talks and re resources all month. We're going to be doing our Front End Friday this week on uh, GraphQL and React. And we may have a Gatsby piece in there as well. So stay tuned. And also our Women Who Code Connect SF 2020 is coming up May 2nd. And our CFP uh, is currently open at this time. We're still taking a few more talks if you have. Um, let me see if we have one more question just before I get to the last. Hold on one second before we get to thanking our sponsors here. I believe I saw one last question. Let's see. I just want to make sure everything's all clear here. It's not showing me the chat. I'm so sorry if we missed your comment, but definitely if you do have a question, uh, please provide it at front end at womenwhocode.com or drop it in our, our Slack channel. I'll definitely be glad to get that question answered for you or get it over to Shruti if it's for her. And definitely we want to just say thank you to our sponsors today, BCG Digital Ventures and the Home Depot. And thank you again, Shruti. Rudy, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to be here with us today. We definitely enjoyed your talk. And also thank you for watching our presentation today. And be sure to follow us online at frontend at womenwhocode.com. And we will see you all on the next webinar series. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.